Yeah, welcome, and, and I'm glad that there's a range from people who haven't started yet to people who's get full head and food into the business and so on. Be, every one of you will get something. The problem is with researching pigs is that you don't know what you don't know. So you don't know what to research. Every time I have a course like this, people go away and they say, I've got 50 times more questions now than I had before because I didn't even know that existed. Now you know, I've got questions about that that I didn't even know that existed. So it, you, 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 by the end of today, you'll have more questions than you came with and so on. But you'll see the bigger picture and you know what to research, what to uh, get more information on and so on. Yeah, as uh, I'm sure quite a few of you can attest to and so on. If you blunder into pig farming, you're gonna you're gonna pay class fees. Whether you pay it up front or behind, you it's gonna cost you in mistakes. And the main main thing is you're gonna lose is time. But you're gonna come a year later and you say, oh, shit, these pigs aren't growing. Sell them, get rid of them, get better breeding stock, and then start all over again. So you've lost a year of, of time and so on. So learn the right thing the first time and do it right. And yes, it's going to cost you a bit of uh, class fees in the beginning, but I, tell, uh, I, I promise you it's going to be 10 times less than making the mistake in, and, and the costs uh, involved with that. So pre prepare right, do the research, start right, good breeding stock, good health, good feed, and enough of it, um, and uh, good management skills and so on. So this, the thing is, we, we all got family who farms cattle and sheep and so on. You know a little bit about that. You grew up with it and so on. Pigs is from the moon. We had a space age. There's nothing here. And, and the bit that's here is, oh, is, is here generally isn't worth following because they're doing it wrong anyway. And they, they can they barely make a, a living and so on. So congratulations to people who started, started and started right. Um, condolences to the ones who started and, and started wrong and so on. But you are on the right track now. And, and the, the guys who are here, even if you're from Buang, they, don't, they teach you the theory, but they don't give you the experience that, that goes with it and so on. You know, I've been here in this business 34 years and so on, and I've got a BSc and, and so on. I'm not going to baffle you with bull and, and baffle you with science and so on. I'm going to make it as practical and, 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 uh, and so on as, as possible. Um, but guys, um, yeah, so today we're sort of focusing, uh, okay, uh, Dr. Mbatsi is going to do the health bit. And guys, he is one of the few pig uh, vets that know the front end from the back end of a pig in Botswana. Him and his business partner, he, he, his business partner also studied in London and so on. But with most pigs, uh, for, uh, most vets do not know the front end from the back end of a pig. Uh, and so on. So you go to the people who know what they're talking about when they're speaking about pigs. Because they are not cattle and they're not sheep and so on. Um, so guys, yeah, so I'm going to zoom in on the, on the, on the feeding uh, things today. Now, guys, to look at profitability and so on. The, the most difficult thing to calculate is the feed consumption of pigs. If you want to do your sums and how much does a pig eat per day and yet on Facebook you ask that and you'll get anything from one kilo twice a day to four kilos a day, any, anything in between, but it doesn't tell you whether the pig was this size or that size. That doesn't give you real information and so on. I developed a spreadsheet that will calculate the right amount of food for each class and the total and the value of that uh, and so on and um, then we added other costs your labor and your veterinary bills and all the other costs and so on which are variables that you can change and it, it gives you answer at the end what is your profit per pig per month per year um, and so on so you can do it uh, and so on but it's also based on um, healthy pigs good genetic pigs and um, good management skills and so on. But, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, what I did was I put the following data into the spreadsheet, leaving all the other variables the same and just changing one of those. So I, I started with um, the, the weaning age of the piglets at 20 age, which is sort of industry standard. If you go three weeks, unless you've got ideal environmentally controlled conditions and so on, your piglets are going to get scoury and, and, and fall off the wagon. 
if you go five and six weeks then it's starting costing you money and so on I'll show you how much it costs you to wean a week later or two weeks later than four weeks and so on but four weeks is industry standard so what I did was I, I left everything the same and I just started with 28 weeks then I left everything the same and I just made that uh, variable uh, uh, 30, 35 days or, or uh, seven, uh, five weeks and then um, uh, six weeks and so on and uh, I'm going to show you how much that one week increment cost you financially then I did the same I left everything the same I uh, left it at 28 days and then so this is the remating period the time from the time that you wean the sow till she gets remated now I wean on a Thursday morning Monday morning 90% of the sows are on back on heat I made them Monday morning Monday afternoon Tuesday morning done dusted if they by some chance don't come on Monday morning by Monday afternoon you can just about guarantee your, 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 uh, that they are on Monday afternoon Tuesday morning Tuesday afternoon uh, noon so Mondays and Tuesdays are mating days guys the beauty of pig farming is firstly you don't you're not d dependent on those little wet thing is falling from the sky the second thing is that uh, it's a factory every Monday is the same jobs you don't have to get up Monday morning what shall I do today you know Monday it's, uh, Tuesdays is mating days Thursdays is weaning days now the, the, the pregnancy of a sow is 114 115 days 114 if you're taking the Tuesday the last mating or if you're taking the first mating at, at Monday then it's 115 days but uh, if you work that out it's uh, it's um, 16 weeks and two days which means if they were mated on Monday they, they farrow on Wednesday if they were mated on Tuesday they farrow on Thursday so Wednesday Thursdays are mating days so all your attention is on the farrowing unit uh, and so on but everything every Monday you do the same jobs every Tuesday you do the same jobs every Thursday so that the whole team that after a short time know exactly what happens on what day you, uh, if you train them in that job they, 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 they get uh, competent in it uh, and so on so um, so now as I said that I'm averaging about four days into farrowing period now if you Especially when you're weaning at five or six weeks and so on and not feeding the sow optimally and so on a sow will always lose weight during lactation there's no ways but if it's a wild pig and she's got three piglets and so on yes you can do that without losing a lot of weight but you don't want three or four pigs you want 10 or 12 she will lose weight so you've got to feed her the maximum amount to lose to minimize that weight loss the days that's in between farrowings is it's almost solely dependent on uh, uh, body condition and if she drops 40 kilos there's no way she will come on in four days so now you've got 21 days that you're feeding her that she's not producing anything that's a cost to you so if, you, if she skips the first heat she's now so I did the same thing I left it at 28 days uh, and but with a four week a four day a 25 day a 64 day 70 so it's skipping one heat two heat three heats and now that affects your pocket and so on um, and then I, the other thing that I changed was I, mean, I left everything at uh, 28 weeks uh, 28 days four day into farrowing period and then eight piglets per litter nine piglets per litter ten now this is w marketed this is not born you know on Facebook everyone says ah 14 piglets oh yeah everyone yeah that's great guy they ask they don't ask the day after when the three was overlaid overnight or four or savage door and so on or how many you market they, they put that 14 up but they be quiet about the rest and all you see is 14 and then you get your first litter and you say oh it's only seven what's going on or two or three and so on um, then then you're very surprised and you oh shit, what am I doing uh, uh, wrong and so on but um, but and your litter your litter size from the first litter to the second to the third to the fourth to the fifth is going up every time why because the sow gets bigger more space to put babies in more back fat to milk from uh, on her back and so on size matters and but yeah no, nobody tells you these kind of things and so on you're expecting 14 babies and all of a sudden you get five or seven um, and so on so um, I've run all of these things and, and all of this guys was done at Tolo's feed prices okay so that's the actual feed prices and it's done at a 90 kilo carcass weight which is about 125 um, uh, kilos live weight uh, and at, uh, at Sen's uh, uh, 
bacon price at the moment of 35. Well, you, you, even the pork they're paying that for. Just this, this yep. 90 kilo carcass. This, yeah, yeah. This is after how many months of feeding? If you're doing it right, six months. Five and a half, six months. If, uh, I'll show you the, the growth rates, what they should achieve, what industry standards are just now. Okay, so the, uh, on top of that, so now I've worked out the exact amount of food, and then we add electricity and labor and veterinary and uh, slaughter fees and breeding stock, and so but all your other running expenses to that. So all of that stays the same, and I'm just changing one variable at a time, so we can isolate it and see if I've got eight pigs and now I've got nine, how much is that worth? And I'll tell you why I'm doing that just now. Okay, so get all the variables in there as well. And so yes, here are the results now. Can you guys, can you at the back sort of see reasonably? Okay, I, I'm going to share this, I'm going to put this PowerPoint on that what I, that I share with you as well, on your emails and so on. But, um, okay, so what I've done is, on the first run, I've put in a 28-day uh, um, weaning and four-day into it. So it's weaning on a Thursday, coming on into a Monday and getting mated and pregnant again. Okay, at eight piglets per litter. Yearly average, uh, yearly income, uh, income per pig and the amount of piglets and so on. So if you've got eight piglets and they're farrowing 2.48 times a year, how do I get to that? It's that plus that plus 115 divided by 365. Slow down for us. Okay, so the litters per sow per year, how many times can a sow farrow per year? If you ask it on Facebook, they'll say two. The right answer is if you're weaning at four weeks, so that's 28 days, plus it takes you four days to get them remated and so on, so that's now 32, and you add that to 115, and you divide it by 365, it gives you 2.48 litres per sow per year. Okay, and that's eight piglets. So now you're making about 374,000 a year. Okay, getting one, and, and, okay, so let me just backtrack a bit. Guys, food is not, cheap food is not cheap if it doesn't make your pigs grow. But if somebody, I've seen a guy advertising watermelons, on the, and I blocked them out because they're just wasting my time. Uh, at, at 10 pull a, a watermelon, oh yeah, that's cheap. Now you go with your, your pickup and so on and you load a ton of watermelons on the back. Watermelons has got 6% solids and so on, so 96% water. So on that ton of food, you've got 60 kilos of food on your back actually. And you've driven 100 k's to go and fetch it and 100 k's back and so on. You just take your petrol uh, and so on. Now you pay 10 kula, so you paid 10 times um, how many uh, watermelons can you put in a ton and so on. And you work out it costs you about 4,000 kula per kilogram. Oh, shit, you get, I can buy maize and I can feed them pure soya for that price and so on. It's not cheap. And, and then that 6% has got so much fiber, well, if you take the water off, What's left is mainly fiber and sugar and so on, and, and that doesn't make your pigs grow either. We'll talk about fiber uh, intensively and so on. But the difference, so trying to save a cent on 10 cents or 10 pula on a bag of food, if it doesn't make your pigs grow, by, if you concentrate, hire a lady. Women are fantastic in piggeries and so on, in the farrowing unit. They've got the mothering abilities, they know what to do. And so on, they'll stand there and wait for that sow and take the baby and wrap him and, and put him on the teeth. And, oh, no, they got, uh, they'll do that the whole day long, it's, it's in their genes and so on. Women are fantastic in piggeries and so on. Also, they've got thin arms, which helps a lot when you've got to pull babies and so on. Uh, but um, if you employed one extra lady just to do that, and you can now average nine piglets, you've made 26,000 pula extra that year. That pays her salary twice over. Three, how many times over? And so on. So the difference between having eight piglets or ten piglets is, what's that? Uh, 150, uh, 150, 150,000 extra a year. Just by having one more piglet. Same, same everything here, just one more piglet. That's uh, the, the price, the, the, the profit difference. Okay. 
So then I still do, left it at four weeks here, but skipping the first heat. So now it takes me 35 days uh, to, to get a mated again. Okay, so this is five week weaning, six week weaning, so these are all six week weanings. Now, looking at the difference between, so the same there, the same amount of peak clits per litter, the difference between uh, just an extra week, difference between those two is how much? 25,000. 25, just by shortening your weaning period. Now, if you're shortening your weaning period and so on, firstly, the sow aren't being drunk on for an extra week, which saves on her back fat and so on, so she's in a better condition, much more likely to get on heat the first get the, within four days and so on. But you've got, you also got to look at the babies. They've got to be around seven kilos to wean them. Otherwise, if they're too small, they go shitty and then they die on you and so on. Now, to overcome that, firstly, you've got to feed that sow as much as she can eat. These guys say you're overfeeding your sows while they're lactating. You can never overfeed your sows while they're lactating. They, are, but they weren't built to have 15 babies and so on. They were built to have three, four out there in the wild. You want 15, you've got to feed her for 15. And so on. Now the right feeding rate for lactating sows is two kilos for maintenance plus a half a kilo per piglet that she suckles. So she has 10 babies that she's drinking from her, that's five kilos plus a two, that's seven kilos a day that you're feeding her. And sows, now especially with gilts, they can't quite eat seven kilos so they lose more weight and uh, we'll talk about the mating weights is, is just now as well, but they're going to lose more um, weight during lactation as a percentage of their body weight and so on as well. Uh, and uh, let's, let's do that now. Guys, do not mate on age. People ask on, on Facebook, that, uh, well, what uh, age should I mate them? And they say it's anything from six, seven, eight, five, and so on. But most guys, that they look at the age, but at, at six months, most guys' pigs are this size still. That they, they barely pork weight, and then they mate them. Why is it important to mate on weight, not on age? Okay, guys, as I said, size matters. If the pig is this size, her womb is this size, she cannot fit 15 babies in it, first thing. Secondly, she hasn't got the reserves on her back to milk from. Remember, she cannot eat enough. There's not enough space in the room and, and of that size, the stomach is smaller as well. She cannot eat enough to not lose weight during lactation. But you've got to minimize it. So you've got to feed her ad lib. Ad lib, guys, means as much as they can eat. As they will eat freely. Uh, and so on. So a guilt needs to be at least 120 kilos before you even think about mating her. Then, when she comes on heat, if you fed her properly, she won't come on heat before then either, and so on. Once she comes on heat, don't just mate her the first time uh, that, that she comes around. Mate on the third heat. Why is that? There's an economic advantage in waiting for the second, third heat. Why? Uh, because uh, their hormones, look, the first heat, this is the first time it's happened, that the hormone system isn't working properly, it's new, she doesn't know what's going on, she's stressed out of her mind, she eats half the babies and so on, um, but um, she, that the, her hormone system isn't developed yet. Often they come on heat the first time and they're on heat but they don't ovulate, so they can't get pregnant. But if you do make them on that first heat, you can if they do get pregnant, you can expect five, well, three, four, five, six, seven babies if you're lucky. Second heat, you're looking at eight, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe. If you wait for the third heat, you can get 12, 13, 14 born alive, I'm talking about now. Okay, so there is an economic advantage in waiting for the third heat and so on. But now, so now she's, you've made that 120. She has had two cycles, so the system is working, that everything is now running, everything knowing where to go and so on. The third thing is, she's now got some reserves on her back to milk from. She's that much bigger and so on. So what I'm saying, guys, is puberty is not the same as sexual maturity. A, a woman, a girl, can get pregnant at 10. Why aren't you, why aren't we getting girls at 10 years old pregnant? Because they're not sexually mature and so on. So there's a difference between sexual maturity and puberty. So make them when they're sexually mature. 
Now, for sexual maturity, there's four things that you need to have. All of them, not some of them. The first thing is at least 120. The second one is have at least 16 millimeters of back fat. <coughs> now, a lot of guys, especially from the breeding companies, well, the breeding companies, when they sell you boars, they have sire lines, which is selected on fast growth, lean growth, uh, um, big muscling, and so on. When they breed gilts for sale, they have totally different selection criteria. I sold gilts to a lady in, in Lubatsi and so on, and another pig farmer went there and he said, no, those gilts are fat. I said to her, do you want a gilt that looks like a bodybuilder with, with that much back fat uh, going into lactation, or do you want somebody with a bit of a bit back fat reserves to go into lactation? I said, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Minimum 16 millimeters. Now, you do get things to measure that and so on. You won't have them. They cost a bit of money. Um, but um, right age, uh, it's, uh, it's sort of seven and a half uh, months, five, uh, between six and seven and a half. R right weight, enough back fat, and having three cycles already. Now, the other thing is that often with the, with the first cycle, what happens is, because everything isn't working, it's not going, and so on, is that she comes on heat once, and you mate her, you, you mate her, tomorrow she's off. So by the third one, she'll, she'll stay on heat for, for 24 hours, um, and, and so on, everything is working properly. So you need all those things in place before you mate her. Now why 120, guys? Now 120, most guys say, oh, you never even get them to 120, why must I wait for 120? The thing is, after you've mated her, after you've mated her, you cannot now put on weight. You can, people think, you know, I mated her at 70 kilos, I'll put that extra weight on in the next 115 days before she farrows. Guys, there is a negative correlation between feeding after mating in the early pregnancy and, and um, appetite during lactation. That's a proven negative correlation. What does that mean? I mean, if you feed it too much in early lactation, early lactation, first third, first th trimester, ladies, you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> then they will eat less during lactation when they need <laughs> that amount of food uh, and so on. So um, if you overfeed them now, if you're trying to gain weight and feeding them more, she's going to eat less in lactation, she's going to drop her weight like a rock, you won't get her pregnant for two or three cycles afterwards, you're losing money all the way to the bank and so on. That is why you've got to wait for that sexual maturity before you, you mate her. Well, what's the number of days for roughly between heat cycles? 90% um, uh, of my cells, uh, if I win them on a Thursday morning, Monday morning they're on. Now, the so is it that what you're asking here? Uh, sorry, yeah. uh, it's a problem. And if you can keep them for the third yeah, yeah. heat, What's the time period between each? 21 days. 21. Yeah, yeah. You need to record it as well. Yeah, yeah. So the 21 day uh, heat, heat period and so on the pigs. How, how often do they go on the cycle? Oh, okay. So after the first puberty, every 21 days they'll come on. Guys, pigs does not come on heat while they're lactating. Cows do. But you, you, you've got a cow who's, who's uh, with, uh, calf at foot and, and drinking milk. And uh, it's, uh, two and a half months later, if you want to uh, calf the same time every year, two and a half months later, she's still giving milk to the cow, to the calf, but she's getting pregnant. Doesn't work like that in pigs. They cannot come on heat while they lactating. So the day that you lack, when you wean her, that sets off the next cycle. Everything starts revving up, and we'll talk about feeding levels during that whole cycle uh, a bit further on as well. But um, yeah, if guys, if you are doing six week weaning. And um, because they, they now so thin, they skip one heat and so on, and you're averaging eight piglets, you're making 276,000 instead of 525, which but if you just spend that extra time and effort in improving your efficiencies rather than searching for cheap food and so on. There's, but if you take that, that amount of money, that's like 200 bags of food that you're getting for free uh, and so on. That is the way to go. Into a trap of not knowing what is the adequate weaning weight of the of the piglets. 
we are winning right now at five weeks because we feel at four weeks they're just not enough. You mentioned it's seven kilos. A lot of Facebook people are bragging like my uh, piglets are 18 kgs at weaning. Like yeah, but they're weaning at seven, eight a weeks. Yeah, like so and then look at the sow and she's a bag of bones with skin what on. What should we expect at four weeks weaning? Uh, what should be the weight of our piglets? Yeah. Now guys, so firstly you've got to feed that sow ad lib as much as she can eat. Now, if you haven't got a sow feeder and so on, what you do is, and, and because it, she doesn't eat 7 kilos the day after birth. Ladies, day after you gave birth, did you feel like eating a lot? Hell no. <laughs> and so on. But so it builds up over the first week, uh, our appetite goes up and so on to, to that 7 kilos. So in the first week it's sort of up like that. But the rest of the lactation, she will eat 7 kilos. A, a sow, a fully grown sow, can eat seven kilos. When she's dry, you're feeding her two and a half, uh, and so on. So she's always peckish, but she can eat seven kilos. So you've got to feed her at maximum rate to get maximum milk production. That, that's no rocket science there. But at the same time, you also got to feed the babies extra. Creep feed. Yes, it's bloody expensive, guys, but they eat very little of it. Uh, I start feeding, well, depending on the litter size. If it's a big litter, Day seven, they said, yeah, we can eat some extra. That's how mom isn't giving us enough. They'll start. But the first, day seven, for the whole litter, the amount of food that I can take close to my hand like that, the whole litter, that's what they'll eat for the day. Second day, it will be two hands full. And by the end of the uh, uh, week four and so on, they were eating about a kilo of creep food. But for the litter, if you do work it out per pig, it's bugger all. If it's five pulo worth of creep food per piglet and so on. But it makes a hell of a, guys, Spend your money on starting them well. Once they, are, once they are stunted, they never recover from it. They never become a fully... That, that guild, if you mate her too early and so on, she'll stay this size, pot-bellied and so on. You go and look at my sows now. Actually, the guys are complaining they're not fitting into the farrowing crate. They're this size and they're that long. We sent two sows away. Um, one was thin after weaning, she had small litters, so she had to go. The other one wouldn't quite get on heat, of course she was huge. Uh, 9,100 for the two, so that, uh, it's, the one would have been worth uh, 4,000, the other one 5,000. Now at 22 pula a kilo, you can work out how much she weighed, uh, carcass weight, at that si but that's full grown size. But you ask most you know, people on the street, how big is a pig? They say something this big. That's, that's sort of what they see a pig. But if, was, if you tell them they're this size and that long, they say, no man, that's a bloody cow. That's not a pig. <laughs> and so on. But, um, but so, so, given the ideal conditions, in those 28 days, you introduce creep from the seventh day. What are you getting? What are the weights that you are getting? Seven to eight. Seven, seven to eight. And, and even. But you, you know how you get these little ones and the bigger ones because yeah, they're dominant they're, yeah, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, of course, you've got to put it where the sow can't get it. And so you've got to have a creep area where, and it's on. In the beginning, we just had a, a burglar bar frame put in the corner where the bum can't get it and put the feed behind there. Later on, we built uh, hot boxes and so on. But it's just somewhere where the sow can't get it. I take a 20-liter water container, one of the square ones, cut it in half, throw about that much concrete in it just to make it a bit heavier, and put the feed in there for the piglets. Now tomorrow morning, if there's a little bit left, take it out, feed it to the sow, put some new stuff, keep it fresh. It's highly palatable, it's bloody expensive, it tastes very nice. Pigs, guys, pigs smell of sense. It's 2,000 times better than yours. 2,000 times better. Now your smell and your, and your taste is related. If you smell better, you taste better. So yes, they've got taste buds. They like sweets. And we, we put in uh, uh, molasses in the creep feed, not too much because it can also cause at a certain level it will cause scouring and so on, but just enough to make it taste nice. They love it, they, like, they go for it uh, and so on. So feed the babies well. And now the other thing is, guys, at weaning, that's a second, second time when people get, get trouble and so on. We all know we've got to keep baby piggies warm. Ideal temperature is body temperature 37, 38 degrees Celsius for newly born uh, piglets and so on. We all know that and we do the best we can. We use hot boxes. You might have electricity at your piggery and have lamps or whatever. Some people have a thing with fire, with coals in and so on. Whatever you do, you try and do your best and keep them warm. But once they at weaning, you throw them there into a, 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 a grower a, a pen and so on and say, yep, you are now on your way. guys. 
the minute you wean them, it's hugely stressful for them. And one, when they're under stress, their temperature requirement goes right up to 38 degrees Celsius again. So what we do is we put we've got a uh, we put into a piece of wood. We put a, a, a sheet of ply over it with a lip in front. And in the mornings, in the winter, everyone in the morning when you get there is underneath there. Why are they there? Because it's warmer than here. What heated it up? Their own body temperature, their own body heat heats it. They, they trap that hot air, and they and the same thing we do with the hot boxes. They heat their own hot box up. You give them a small contained area with the roof on, keep the body heat trapped, and they heat themselves up. In New Zealand, where I come from, it's bloody cold and so on, so piggeries is trying to heat them up rather than cooling them down like here. But uh, you have a, a grower shed with 400 pigs in and it's closed. In the morning you get there and it's like a sauna, sauna in there, just from their own body heat that they produce and so on. So, guys, you know, the, 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 you'll have these figures and so on. But what I'm showing you is that, that there's huge gains to be had by improving your efficiency. And you can't improve your efficiency if you don't have good food and so on. And that 10 puller bag that you think you're saving if you add your, your time and your petrol to go and fetch this stuff everywhere, um, you, you actually not, it's not cheap and it doesn't make your pigs grow. The weaning stressful. There's three stress factors. The first one is Mom isn't there anymore, okay, you can't do anything about that, and so on, but don't take the mum away, change the food, change the pen, all in one go, and you'll find that for a week or ten days, they stop growing, they actually lose weight before they catch on again, and so on. Guys, uh, yeah, uh, so um, stagger the stress factors, so how do you do that? Take mum away, leave them in the farrow crate where they're born, that's their whole world, they, they can't see out, they can see this, the roof, and the four walls. This is their universe. Now you're putting them on a different planet. And oh shit! It's a stressful new place. Second thing is what people usually do. They now they they get sad. They four weeks of creep and it's expensive. So you put them onto weaner, which is a little bit cheaper and so on. And guys, doesn't matter if you put in five percent more bran or five percent less bran. If you change the food, they, you can see it in their growth rates immediately. Immediate effect uh, and so on. So. Feed, leave them take, in the farrow crate, take the mum away. Week later, now they, they forgot about mum, okay? Now you move them to the new pen, same food still. So you're actually feeding creep for five weeks. If you're weaning it four weeks, that, that last week you sort of go 50-50, 75, 25, and you're changing over to wean in the fifth, by the end of the fifth week and so on. Uh, but at weaning, keep the food the same, keep the pen the same. Week later, change the, uh, the pen, sort of a week later change the food and then it's smooth and they keep on growing and they're going there and then you'll get the maximum out of your uh, your winning weight and so on so and guys you know, they reckon for every kilo you can put onto a four week old wiener will save you three weeks on the other end other end they're eating three kilos a day for three weeks um, and so on you can spend that extra bit on good quality creep food and so on to get that extra kilo of food onto your wiener and so on. You work that cost out rather than paying it there, pay it here and you'll get the gain. And tell it if they get a good start, they cruise through to, to get 120 kilos at six months, 135 at six months. So guys, this, uh, uh, this um, spreadsheet that I've done, this is industry standards. So, uh, yeah, sorry, it's a bit blurry. Nine to 10 weeks, they should be eating 1.18 kilos per day, and they should be weighing 28.7 kilos. So, because <coughs> you keep on saying kilograms, kilograms. So there's a lot of weight that happens. It's because as a starter, I mean, I, I use my, my eyes. You know, good good question, I'm very glad you asked that. Small bucket. And, <laughs> so, okay. so you're saying I should get a scale? Um, Okay, that's one way. Okay, let me let me answer you. A, a wiener, a, a creep wiener grower should be fed ad lib. What does that mean? As much as they can eat. Big piggeries put on lights in their grower shed. At 12 o'clock at night, they switch the lights on. Why? To wake the pigs up. Why? So they can eat. Get up. Oh, it's breakfast, and they have a, and then the light goes off. So an hour later, go back to sleep. So they don't burn the energy off. Five o'clock, the sun comes up. They oh, breakfast again just to get more food into them 
Why? So they grow better. The more food, the more growth. We will talk about that a lot more uh, in, the, in the thing and so on. So um, your, your growing herd, ad lib, and I'll show you a self feeder that I make for out of one sheet of ply. It works like an absolute bomb and so on uh, just, just now as well. So your growing herd is ad lib. Your sows, on the other hand, um, you want to, if they are, come out of uh, lactation, if you wean them, and, and they're in a, in a good condition, you feed them a certain level. If you're feeding them, if, they, if they're thin as a bone, then of course you feed them more. But now uh, on, on one of our WhatsApp groups, somebody said, get, what scoop do you use? I used to use, uh, from Cephalana, I used to get a, a big tin mug at that size, actually, that size. Um, and so on, get a, just a normal tin mug, but giant size like this and um, I used to use that and so you weigh that and you, then you know you tell you guys with your sales you give them one scoop uh, sorry two scoops or two and a half scoops and then you know exactly but I'm starting to make these things for the for that exact the exact reason so what you do is you take one of these and if you want to feed if you want to know two kilos then you put two kilos of food here sort of level to you scoop it in keep it sort of bang so it's lying flat and you know if it's full to there, you, every time you've got two kilos. So you, you sort of cut this off, at a, you put the food in, get the level, and then you cut it off from, from there on and so on. Then you know your guys, because yeah, your guys, you can say so many kilos, they're just going to put in what they want to, and you, you're oblivious of what's happening. But here, you've got a set amount of food going into it. So your sour food needs to be weighed off, but rather than weighing the food, get a container that takes a certain amount and you say one scoop, two scoops, one and a half scoop and you know that they're getting the right amount. Okay, so I'm going to make these commercially. If you want one, put your name on the list and I'll make it for you. How much you're feeding, also, and, and also, if you're the, so you've got the quality of food, the quantity of food, and then how you're feeding it. Don't put it all in one spot because especially if you've got a narrow, you put it here and there's four cells that fit in here and they all stand next to each other but there's six pigs in the pen and so on so put it so that everyone so put this four here and get the, the dominant four there and if there's two more pigs throw off a scoop there and a scoop there so that all of them can eat at the same time it's important that you feed so that they all can eat at the same time with the cell feeder Okay, you get, uh, it's got five compartments and there might be 20 wieners in that pen, but food is 24-7. You that dominant can't stand in front of the food, he's got to go and drink water. When he goes there, the, the, the submissive ones go and eat. So there's food, and they also don't scream when you get there in the morning, ah, I'm hungry and so on. That's always a bad sign. The ones who should be screaming is your sows, your dry sows, because they eat two and a half kilos, they can eat seven. So yes, they're always peckish and so on. If you've, if you've got leaves and you've got grass and lucerne and all this other shit that people ask, can you feed your pigs? Yes, feed it as a snack. Make their stomachs full. They feel content. Ah, yeah. But they have two and a half kilos of food and five kilos of grass. Yeah, nah. Go and sleep nicely and so on. But don't feed it as a, as a feed source. Feed it as a snack and so on. Um, but guys, we are getting at 26 weeks, we're getting them to 135, killing out is up to 110 kilos carcass weight. This is achievable. This can be done with the right food, with the right genetics, with the right health, and the right management. This is achievable. People say, no, uh, it can be done. It's being done right here. And, and that will make you money, good money. If it takes you, guys, if you're selling a, a uh, well, a bacon at eight months, you, I guarantee you're not making a cent. And it, a lot of guys produce pigs, they get him up to weight, they send him to abattoir, end of the month, they, uh, end of the year, they send it to the auditor and he comes back and says, made no profit. How can I not make any profit? I've sent tons of food to the abattoir. The pigs ate up your profit. That's how easy it is to lose money if you're not, not measuring, if you're not doing what you should be doing. Okay. Um, Just maybe to, to comment on the genetics. Uh, when we started our piggery, uh, Tata is one of the people that we visited. She had nice pigs, but they were expensive. The price she gave us was, we just said, ah, this woman is crazy. So we went around and bought much cheap stuff, cheap stuff, cheap stuff. Uh, three months later, this guy comes to our piggery. And he, you know, 
Okay, it was good he came, but when he left, we are sad. Because he just condemned all the pigs we had in the, in, in the figure. He said, you guys are holding on to, I don't know what to call it. I call but them yeah. razorbacks, you know, the ones with backbones sticking out like that. Actually, Richard coined a good phrase. He, he said, you know you've got good genetics if you can roll a soccer ball down the length of the back without it falling off sideways. What does that mean? It's got muscling and the backbone is there and the muscles are standing here. You can roll a soccer ball down. If the backbone is the highest point on your pig's back, then you know you've got rubbish. We made the same mistake. We had uh, close to 30 or so nice, well, nice in our definition at the time, uh, gills and all that, but it was all rubbish because we were running away from people like Tato who were expensive at the time. And she knew, she knew what she was talking about. She knew her stuff, but we said, uh, we went to a piggery once and then we never came back. But now, I think now she's now uh, one of our admirers because yeah, what we learned from her, we are now doing it. But yeah, we didn't buy from her because we thought she was expensive. Today we experience the same thing. People come to our piggery, they see our pigs, they say, ah, but you guys are expensive. Eight months later, you see the same person sending a message to say, you know what, I bought these pigs here, they're not growing. I said, yeah, but we spoke eight months ago. I said, no, I bought somewhere. Now I need to abort to, to improve because I, I'm stuck with shit stuff here. I need to improve it. So we learn through that. I think running away from spending is expensive. We, we, we've gone through it. We know how it's like. And a lot of us here are going to go through it. So try and get your genetics right the first time. Those, those mistakes cost you 20 times more than paying to know, to, to avoid them beforehand, guys. It's, 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 it's a no-brainer. Okay, so I said to you that, that four-week weaning weight is every kilo you can put on at four weeks saves you three weeks on the other end and so on. Get them, spend your money on getting them a good start. Anything that goes wrong in the first four weeks, by the time you slaughter them, they pork weight where their pen mates are bacon weight. That's the other thing we do wrong, that we want all of them to go at bacon weight. So we send the big ones and we keep the smaller ones and feed them for another three, four, five weeks till they that weight. Guys, send the whole pen. Send those shitty ones as pork weight. Get rid of them, they're gonna eat up your money. Send them as porkers when you're sending the big ones as baconers. Don't try and feed those up to bacon weight. They're gonna eat up all your profit. Not worth doing. All in, all out. Um, and so on. Okay, good start, first thing. Now the second thing, Guys, what is the most important piece of information you need to gather on a piggery to make a profit? But if you're keeping records, you're recording different things, what is the most important piece of information you need on your piggery? How old they are. Now, I guarantee you if I go to any one of your piggeries, and I ask you, how old is that pig? What you'll say? Mm. <laughs> Ten weeks. <laughs> Truth is, you haven't got an idea how old he is. Because, especially when you've got more than one or two sows, but if you had one, okay, if it was born on Christmas Day, and you can work out the age. <laughs> so when you've got two, you multi, you cross foster, and you separate the males from the females, three weeks down track, and, oh shit, I can't remember where they born. Was it last week? Or the, and so on. So the, the age, now, 16 weeks, or well, six months later, and I ask you, how old is that pig? I haven't got a clue. How can you benchmark? How can you say, you know, where are they here, what should, what should they be, and so on? Very easy, I'll tell you now, just now. But what you need to know is, industry standard, at 17 weeks, they need to weigh 70 kilos. You need to know that. At 20 weeks, they need to weigh 100 kilos. You need to know that. So. Now you need to know how old is that pig first. How do you do that? Guys, at, at teeth and tailing, you're busy handling them. You can ask the guys who've been with me on a practical course. It takes me 45 seconds to do iron injection, teeth, cutting all their teeth, the tail off, and to give them the ear notch. And the ear notch is for the week of the year that they were born in. So they're born between the 1st and the 7th of January, they get a, a number one on their ear. Between the 4th, 7th and 14th, number 2, and I'll show you the, the notching system now. So you can go to my piggery now and say, how old is that pig? And I look at the ear and I can tell you within three, of, well, within three or four days of that week, that's how old that pig is. So when I load them for the abattoir and so on, I look at the ears and say, okay, but, yep, there's uh, 26 weeks, 24 weeks, 25 weeks, 
all in that range going to the abattoir. So you've got to know how old they are. Very easy. How do I do, do that? Okay, very easy, man. You can't get any... Uh, uh, now, when you read a number, well, when you put your head over the wall, they're looking at you. It's very difficult to see their back end sometimes, especially when you're heat spotting. You've got to foot here and go and look at that side to see the fannies and so on, see whether they're on heat. But when you put your head over the wall, they're looking at you. So that we're looking at the pig doing that, and when you're teeth and tailing, you do the teeth and tailing with him looking at you, like that. Now, when you read a number, you read 52. You don't read 250. So the tens are on this side, and the ones are on that side. Okay? Number one, at the top of, now here, is that, that thick bit of the ear here. You don't want to cut that because it bleeds like a pig. So just off that thick bit, number uh, one notch. And, and the notch that we use, uh, Tolo has got them stocked. Mine had to import from South Africa and so on. Tolo has got that. It's, they've got iron, they've got um, Ivermec. Um, they don't do vaccines because they need a vet. And that we'll talk about Mbatsi uh, does stock uh, vet, uh, vaccines and so on. But so number one is one notch at the top of the ear. On the left hand, on your left hand side, the pig's right hand side. One, two, three is the tip. Five is just under the tip, not too low, but just so you see it's not the tip. So there would be better. That's five. So out of that you can make nine. Okay. On this side, exactly the same with the zero. So now that's instead of one, it's a ten and a ten, a thirty and a fifty. Now out of that you can do ninety-nine, um, but you only need fifty-two. So you do that till the end of the year, new year you start at one. And so at the moment we've got pigs that was, it's sort of 20, or 20 weeks in, in last year and six weeks this year. So you still can work out it's 26 weeks old and so on. So, and it, it, it's ching, 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 it takes, I can do ear notching, iron injection, teeth and tailing in under 45 seconds. So like that. And you've got that information all the way through. If you are on this, between the 1st and the 7th of January, you would have marked him with week one. Okay? Now, at the moment, where we are now? We are um, sort of middle of, uh, well, third week of February. So, four weeks in January, three weeks. So, this is week seven. So, if the piglets were born today, I would mark them with seven. Seven would be a one, a one, and a five. Oh. Yeah, no, not, you don't do all of them, you just do the ones that you need. So a one and a one and a five. Next week, eight. So eight would be a five and a three. Okay. Uh, nine, a five, a three, and a one. Also, the way you not represent the number. Exactly. So these are the, the ones and these are the tens. Okay. Exactly the same place, just with a zero behind it. Now, at the moment, guys, the thing is if you're selling breeding stock, like we do. Um, I want to not just sell you a boar, I want to sell you gilts and a boar without giving you related animals. But we've got three uh, different boars and so on. So what we're doing at the moment is our number one boar, we put a notch on his left ear. Our number two boar, uh, a notch on the right ear, number uh, uh, th sorry, th th three boar and one with both or nothing. So we could actually do four different boars. So these tell us who the father is. Those tell us how old the pig is. Now I can sell you one ball that's unrelated to these gilts from the same piggery. Obviously, if they're the same age, they can't have the same month within six months anyway. So if you know they are totally unrelated to each other. So you say one ball is uh, number 100. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And or, the other ball is 200. Yeah. Exactly. And the other one is 300. Yeah, the 300 or, or no marks, so which is get zero, zero. So you could do four, you could do no marks, one mark, two marks, three marks. Yes, both. So you could actually do four balls um, if you're doing it that way. Now, go. And, 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 and when you do the uh, injections and everything. Good question. You mark Guys, if you go in the handbook, they'll say on day three. But. Guys, the guys who were the best or the guys who've done this before, those needle teeth are razor sharp. They are hypodermically needle sharp. And there's two big ones here and two big ones there and two big ones there and two big ones there. Now, uh, ladies, you can, you're more informed on this. Guys, think of other body parts that is sen <laughs> equally sensitive. Imagine that teeth sucking from there. 
And man, as soon as a second one, okay, guys, you know, um, there's, there's a saying, sucking the hind tit. You know that saying, it means you're being done short by. That comes from a pig, a pig because the top teats have more milk than the bottom teats. So when they come out, the first baby goes for these two teats. The second one says, now I want that one too. Either they bite and those needle, needle teeth puncture the teeth and then mastitis and then the mom says, bugger you, I'm sore, I'm not feeding any of you and they all die and so on. Or he tries to rip them off and they rips it and so on. Either way, it hurts like hell and, and it damages the cell. That can happen five minutes after birth. If you wait till day the, three, the, 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 the damage is done, guys. I don't want to do them when they're still wet and navel string wet. I do it the day after birth. And I'm not going to do the teeth and then two days later do the rest. When I do in one thing, I do them all the, the day after birth. For me, it works. You can go to wait for day three, but it's, uh, it's uh, 45 seconds per, per piglet. Is that the same time that you do the marching? Yeah, 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 exactly. Do you castrate it for? Guys, in 34 years of pig farming, I've not castrated one pig. Why? The reason for castration is firstly so that the sisters and brothers don't mate each other. And so on. The second one is uh, that boar taint. Now, not all pigs get boar taint. But if you sell a pig to somebody and they get boar taint, they will never buy pork off you again. And so on. So, now. So yes, you can castrate. There is an uh, injection that you can give them called Improvac. You give it four weeks before you want to send them to the abattoir and that takes away any bortaint that there might be. But guys, bortaint starts at puberty. I said uh, puberty is sort of uh, six uh, weeks, uh, sorry, sorry, six, seven, eight months old uh, uh, is, is where puberty starts, especially for your, your boars is a little bit later than your gills and so on. They are in the fridge already by then. I've never sold a pig older than six months uh, and so on. Then they get, otherwise they go over that 135 kilos and then if, you, if your pig slaughters out 110 kilos, you're getting 35 pula a kilo. It goes at 111, 22 pula a kilo. That's like 1,500 pula overnight that you're losing. That hurts, hey, that hurts. That hurts your heart and, and your brain as well. So guys, grow them fast. Then you don't need to castrate. Look, uh, what does the balls do? Apart from mating and so on, they also produce growth hormone testosterone. It is, uh, at the Olympics, these Eastern European women who won the, the weightlifting and the shot put and so on because they've got muscles like that and a beard like a man, they inject them with testosterone. That's why, guys, balls are your fastest growers. They are your leanest growers. They are your most best feed converters. Because if you castrate them, they go fat. Now, guys, to put on one kilogram of fat takes two, two and a quarter times more food than, than growing meat. Think, how can that be? If you take, a, if, if, if you take meat, how much water is in, you, in your body? One kilogram meat. About 75% of that is water and that is solid. So the water is water, but the solids, the growth, comes from the, new, the, the dry matter that you're feeding there. Fat, same amount, also weighs one kilo, it's a bit more because it's lighter than water anyway. How much of that do you think is water? Ten percent is water. This one, 75% is water. That's why it takes you two and a quarter times more uh, food to put on a kilogram of fat. So if you're growing fatter boars, it costs you more on food. So it's, it's, it's a no-brainer and so on. And so how do I deal with, with, um, with not castration? Firstly, I, uh, I, you know, I make sure that they grow fast and they, they go to an abattoir before they... The second thing is, um, guys, when you've got a pen, and you've weaned a sow, and now you've got nine, eight, nine, ten babies. Did they sleep in a little corner like this, like, like one square meter in the pen? But if there's ten square meters here, that's not an efficient use of space. I put two litters in. Now, if you've got 25 cells, which means you've got one sow a week farrowing, um, it's better to mate two sows every two weeks than mating one every week. 
because if you've got two sides fattening, one gives you seven and the other one gives you 15, so you, you, you cross foster and so on and they both grow better and so on. So I put two litters in up to about week 10. So then they weigh about 20 kilos, 20, 25 kilos. Then I split males, females. And so I've used that space more efficiently and now they, they never meet each other, they're never in the same pen again, so there can't be any mating of sisters and things going on. So at, at what age do you split the sexes? About week 10. We now move them out of the weaner pens into the grower pens, basically, so, so depending on your system. From weaner to grower already you are splitting? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So guys, now this, this uh, per week and so on, uh, you, 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 we've got guys here that's got 6 sows, 12 sows, 25 sows, it's actually 21. If, you, if you're producing a, 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 a four-week weaning and, and four days between farrowing and so on, um, you actually need 21 sows to have one sow farrowing every week of the year. I say 25, why? Because during the hot months, especially for January, February and so on, um, sows get mated, they come on eat, they get mated, but they return to service, and especially your gilts and so on. So just one or two extra just to fill that gap so you've got income every week uh, and so on. But guys, yeah, just last week in, in, uh, on Facebook, somebody had five sows, one boar, all coming on eat at the same time. Said, oh, yeah. She asked it, is that all right? One, one boar can mate 21 sows, but that's one a week. That's not five in, in one week, and so on. If you do, his battery goes flat, and he loses interest, and so on, and, uh, and so on. So, um, guys, it's important to stagger your farrowings. Now, with gilts, it's difficult because they are in control of when they're coming on heat. Sows, you are in control. You say, I'm taking the babies away. You know, we, uh, four days later, she comes on heat. So, you, but if you got them spread, uh, so your farrowings with your gilts, firstly, buy them at different ages. Don't buy 10 gilts at the same age because they're all going to come on heat. Transport there brings them on. Next to a ball of sudden brings them on and they all come at the same time. Ah, they need more balls. Buy them at different ages so they come on in at different times and so on. But, um, so when you stagger them, you have one litter that's one week old, one that's four weeks old, one that's eight weeks old, one that's, and so on. So those are starting to pay for those. If you have, you have five litters all coming at the same time, you've got 50 babies, that's a lot of money in food. So you've got to stagger them and so on. And um, yeah, so it, think of 21 to 25 sows, gives you one sow a week farrowing. Of course, if you halve it, then it's one every two weeks. If you, so that's sort of 12 sows. If you're looking at uh, six sows, then you're doing one a month. So make sure that you space them out. And if they're not perfectly spaced, every time you wean them, you, skate, you move them on a week or you bring them in. Uh, so if they want to bring them earlier, um, you might do this one a bit later and, and that one a bit further and so on. It's very between four and five weeks just to start spacing them out evenly. And then, you, then you're also using your building more efficiently. If this thing costs a shitload of money and the amount of pigs that you put through it a year pays or doesn't pay for, for that uh, pen of yours. Okay. So, yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll share that with you. Um, actually, I've got, we're coming back to this cheap food thing. Now, I want you to close your eyes. Visualize the plate of food that was in front of you last night. Now, your, your wife knows how much food you need. Every night she dishes that amount of food. Now, if you haven't gained weight in the last year, that food is maintenance food. What is maintenance food? It's a food that you need to move around, to catch food, to go and fetch food, to, to live, to heart to pump, to produce body heat, but there's nothing sellable from it, except for burps and farts and body heat uh, and, and some manure if you're selling uh, pig manure and so on, but there's nothing sellable from maintenance food. So now your wife's saying, nah, I think I like a bit more suspension um, in, in my husband and so on. I'm going to give him another <laughs> scoop of, of um, the millipup uh, every night. Now you're growing. That is used for growth. Guys, when you're feeding at low levels, if this is maintenance, and you're feeding that much of food, you might get a, a certain amount of growth. But if you fed that much more, 
you've doubled your growth. Not that much more, just that much more, and you've doubled your growth. You see where I'm going with this? So just that much more doubles your growth. Not that much more, just that much more doubles your growth. Okay, let's take this. Uh, just next one. Okay, so now if you take the, this, this, the first one again, where there was one block here for all of these columns, but now you're taking this and you're feeding it here. So now they're going twice as fast and reach the same weight so many days earlier. What you have saved, you haven't saved those, but you've saved all of that, that maintenance food. So every day that your pig gets older, the first food that he uses is for maintenance. And that is how you save money. Guy on Facebook about a year ago asked on Facebook, how can I save money on food? My answer was, feed them more. And the guy said, no, you didn't understand the question. So I understood it perfectly and I laid it out for you. Oh, shit, that doesn't make sense, uh, doesn't it? And so on. Uh, oh, just the next one there. Okay, now um, you're going to ask me, how do I know this is 30%? I'll show you in the next slide. But, so they did, they did a huge trial. I mean, talking about 10,000 pigs and so on. And they fed them ad, ad lib, which means as much as they can eat. Okay? And one, one group of pigs. The next group they fed at 90% of ad lib, 80, 70, 60, and so on. And they, they went to here. And I've taken the growth rate uh, and so on and extrapolated that and in another two weeks um, they would have been at zero growth um, and so on. So the, about th if, no, this 30% is 30% of ad lib. But when you're feeding at 60%, it is half of the food that you eat, that you're giving them, goes into maintenance, not, not a third. Half is now going into, into maintenance. Feeding the year, that a quarter of it is going into, uh, into, uh, into growth and others into maintenance. So you can see this maintenance thing, you've got to put as much food into them as early as possible. Also remember, a piggy that's a young pig, a small pig, the growth rate or the feed conversion rate of a young pig is the same as a chicken, which is the gold standard in animal growth and so on. Two, food, two kilos of food puts on one kilo of meat. Live weight, sorry. When they are baconers, it takes four kilos, okay, that's including their mom and dad's food, four kilos to put on one kilo of food. So you can see the older they get, the worse their fee conversion gets, and so on. So get as much food into them early. Get them off to a good start. And those weaners, that's 20 kilos at weaning and so on, uh, ach, sorry, uh, 10 kilos, at, uh, or seven, eight kilos at weaning, they do not have a, a, a problem. They grow through, man, you can cut their legs off, they grow fine after that. But if you don't, they, they are buggered. They already buggered. Get rid of them, buy other ones, and so on. Get them off to a good start. Okay, um, so yeah, very important is the, it's 30% when you're feeding them at the, but when you're feeding them at this rate, it, uh, it, more of it is a percentage of maintenance which is wasted wasted next one okay so yeah this is a trial i've, I've just co converted these figures a bit those are the figures they got so they fed the pigs they were swing most of the all the groups were sort of 26 kilos at the start of the trial okay they fed them for 30 days and these guys um they they started there they ended there uh, so they went from 26 to 50 kilos in 30 days. These guys went from 26 to 33 kilos in 30 days. Okay, the weight gained, these guys put on 7 kilos, those guys put on 23 kilos. More importantly than that, uh, so um, now I've extrapolated this, okay, I took it to not, not, to 20, uh, not for 30 days, I took it from 26 to 50 kilogram uh, weight gain. It would have taken these guys 100 days to go from there to 100, uh, to, sorry, to 50 kilos. 100 days, because they're growing that much per day. And so if you divide that into that, you'll get to 100 days. Okay. These guys, uh, in the, doing the same weight range, would have taken 31 days. So 
feeding them there or here, you've saved nine, uh, how many days? 70 days, 69 days. Which means that you could just sort of put another lot through your piggery. And so on. So you've lost days. Also, to, now the food used from 26 to 50 kilos, these guys would have used 76 kilos of food. These guys would have used 48 kilos of food. Now this is just from 26 to 50. Now I'll take it from 10 or from 8 to 130. How much food do you think you can save? Shit loads. Lots. Guys, grow them faster. Feed them as much as they can eat when they can eat it. And so on. That is the only way to make money. Okay, uh, uh, next one, uh, Rich. Okay, now guys, I, I don't work for Tolok. I, I'm a pig farmer, we had a feeding company. People think pig uh, feeding companies make huge profit margins. They don't. They make about 14%. Feed companies are trucking companies. They bring huge amounts of food in. They make a small margin, but they do it three, four, five times a year. So if you're making 10% profit margin, but you're making it four or five times a year, you've got 40, there's not many banks that pay 40% interest on your money and so on. Eh? But it's massive capital uh, uh, expenses and so on. Tolo can store 900 tons at any one time on site and so on. They've got nine trucks, and now I've got one of those silos that can put it in, into your silo as well. But that trucks go South Africa back every day and so on. They buy maize when it comes off the paddock from the farmer in South Africa at the lowest possible price because they, they're buying the hundreds of tons and so on. The cheapest price, if you go out now to anybody, anybody you know, the cheapest price you're going to pay for a bag of 50 kilogram of maize and so on is about 150 to 200 at the moment. Yeah, you try and buy it. They're buying it off the paddock at 90 or 80 and so on. I cannot produce the food myself as what I'm buying it from, from Tolo. Now, guys, they are cheaper guys. This is Bob's standard, Botswana Bureau of Standards. This is the minimum specs that a feed company has to comply with. Guys, and I know when uh, Dr. Mbatsi is here, I'll, I'll, I'll ask him about this again. Those things are archaic. They are way too low. Now the feed companies here, all of them, including Tolo before I got there, um, spec their food on the minimum standard because that's the cheapest to make and guys I can guarantee you they do not grow at those levels and if they don't grow it doesn't matter how cheap it is it's not making you money and so on so those are the the, 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 the Bob standards there's not one food company who feeds their own food to their own pigs when I started with Tolo uh, did when we closed our feed mill down uh, this is about March, February, March last year. It's about a year from now. It's a year, it's a year now. Yeah. Right? Um, I went and bought a grower. I fed it to my pigs. Uh, they just ground to a halt. Shit, this is not working. So I took my formulation that I've been using for the last two years and that I've been mixing for 34 years for myself. I said, mix me, can you mix me this red formulation? So they yep, okay. Then they say, oh, throw that one out. We'll just do yours. And then I gave them all the other uh, feeds formulations and they're mixing those. So those are tried and tested and they're getting the industry standard growth rates. I can guarantee you that. If you've got their genetics and you're using that food in the right amounts, you will get the same growth rates out of it. And so on. So but, um, Thomas, are you, are you, sorry, sorry. Are you going to get to a point where you show us uh, the calculation of, of food per, because I buy 50 kilograms. I didn't have this thing, like I said, I use a bucket and just got feel, they look hungry. Um, but are you going to get to a point where you can show us uh, this is how much you are you're buying for so many or Yeah, yeah. so that, that previous one with the, with the reds and so on, you can work out, okay, they're going to eat this for seven days, <coughs> it should cost you that much, and seven days that or with that so many kilos. So you can work out your, to go from 28 kilos to 120 kilos, you can work out 
Now it's time seven and we'll give you the, 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 the total fee. If I know the, 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 the ration that each pig should take at a particular age. Age, that's it. Four for that week. If you multiply it by seven, you add it all up and then you contact and so on. So guys, obviously, uh, it's, uh, it's um, what you call it, um, industry secret, not secrets, but it's industry sensitive. I'm not going to give you the formulation, but I have a training program that teaches you how to balance ration. Guys, it's not just throwing two or three things together. There's, there, there's a, a lot more to balancing a ration than throwing maybe some soya together and so on. What about the calcium phosphate? amounts, the, the ratios between it, the amino acids, all of those kind of things. So um, I've got a training course that teaches that. It's, it's actually the feeding part of a bigger course, which is A to Z of pig farming and so on. It's all in those little the contacts on those little things that you've got there. But um, guys, I can guarantee you the food that Tolo is, is, um, is producing will give you the growth rates. You've got good genetics, good health, and good management and so on. You're talking about the C, I mean the the Bob standards as, as, as stipulated there. Um, I think we've we've seen that uh, these standards maybe they need to be revised. I can yeah. tell you. Protein of nineteen is too low. Grower yeah. at fifteen is way too low, yeah. and so on. More importantly, these ones here. I mean, these are minute. Uh, our wiener yeah, is fifteen. Our grower is uh, 13.8 and so on. Now, 13.8, 12.5 doesn't sound that much, but let me explain to you what a, a megajoule is. Megajoule is a, uh, it is a million joules. What is a joule? We all know what a centimeter looks like and a mile looks like. And what's a, what does a joule look like? It's a measurement of energy. A joule <coughs> is defined as if you take one kilogram, the energy used to take one kilogram lifted one meter in one second. That's a joule. So a million, with a megajoule is a million times, times the, the difference 2.5 or whatever. So it's, it's, it's a bit of extra energy doing that and so on. That, that, that's what's going into growth now instead of labor and so on. So with these, these things and protein levels make a massive, mass, massive difference and so on. And I, we've noticed with uh, Tolo that creep is 20%. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not 19%. So, yeah. so it's, it's the influence well. from the industry. We told them 19% nine, doesn't make the, those animals grow. Put more. This one, definitely. Um, we do, we're not do, making a finisher at the moment. If you're going over 50 sales and so on, it might pay you to do a finisher as well. But on a smaller scale, get, get, uh, going through with grower and so on is fine. Um, that would save you a little bit. Um, uh, a wiener would cost you about the same as, as a dry sow in, in uh, price and so on. Um, but um, get smaller uh, quantities, it doesn't uh, um, warrant splitting another ration in, in there and so on. But um, yeah, so 19, 18, 15, 14, 12 and so on. This is the Bob standard. Just go to the next one. Excuse me. Yeah, let's, let's, yeah. Let's, let's, okay. just, uh, just the guidance. How long do you feed on a crib wiener? Okay, so, so, so creep, we feed from day seven if it's a big litter, day 10 if it's a smaller litter, through till a week after weaning. Whether you're weaning at four weeks or five weeks or six weeks, I would feed it till the week after weaning, just to wean them with the same food and so on. Then a week after weaning, you would start them with weaner and you would phase it in, you would change it overnight. So if you go 50, 50, 75, 25 and change it over to, to, to weaner. Then wiener, I would feed up to uh, 10, 12 weeks when you take them out of the wiener uh, rooms into the uh, uh, grower's shed and so on. 10 to 12 weeks, change them onto grower, and I would feed that through all the way to, to, to slaughter. My gilts and so on, I also feed through to slaughter, or to, to slaughter weight, which is 125, 130 anyway, so that they're also at mateable size. Uh, they come on heat, especially if you take them, pick them, if you, if you move pigs, if you pick, stress them in any way, so picking them up here and taking them to your pigs is stress, if you put them there next to a born, oh, all of a sudden they pop like cherries and so on to come on heat and so on. Wait for the second one, wait for the third one, done. Kumbas, sorry, another question. When do you switch your, your, your gills and your boars from grower to dry cell? Okay, uh, good, good question, uh, Igor. Okay, so guys, remember I said to you, 
as soon as you've mated those gills, wait till they up to weight. Because you can't put it on later because it's going to have effect in your, in your lactation. As soon as you've mated them, step them down from, uh, from ad lib to uh, about two kilos. Uh, two kilos on a, on a gilt, which is not full size yet, will still give her growth but not fast growth so she that affects her appetite. Still grow, still grow. Uh, uh, no, no, uh, so no, at, at weaning you can step them down to, to uh, a, a dry sow uh -huh. at two kilos. So after the first uh, farrowing basically you can switch them to dry sow? <laughs> no, no, after, no, no, after, after first mating. Uh, weaning. Yeah, yeah. No, after, if it's a gilt, after you've weaned her for the, after the first lactation, uh, sorry, after uh, mating for the first time. Right. As soon as she's mated, step her down. Okay. Otherwise, okay. With that, that yeah. early part of the pregnancy, if you overfeed her, then affect, affects the lactation feed. Yes. Okay, I see. Which stage is this in the ad All your growers, your creep, your weaner, your, your grower is ad lib. I'll, I'll, I'll show you a self feeder that, that, I've, that we use and so on, very easy to make um, just now. But just sort of memorize those and then look at the next slides. Now, this is NRC, the next one. This one was a hand that said. Sorry. Yeah, the, the dry females which are pregnant. Yeah, yeah. Dry cells are pregnant cells. Most of should be. The feeding, regardless of the age of the gestation, is just the same. Okay, so feeding dry cells, guys, the, the rule of thumb is. You want to keep them in a body condition of three out of five. Uh, so uh, if you go on the internet, say sow body condition scoring, and it will show you pictures of a sow that's one, which is emaciated, with thin as bone, with a bag of bones with skin on. Two, which is thin, but with a little bit of meat. Three is perfect condition for mating and keeping in that condition. Four is getting fat, five is obese, uh, and so on. Now it doesn't pay you to go into four and five. You say that you're losing money feeding them. You don't want to go below three because then they, if they don't have the reserves to milk from. So once they mate it, well, you, you want to try and keep them at three so that they are going to get pregnant with a good sized litter. And then after, during that 115 days, you just want to keep them at that body condition score. That, there's no money in, in overfeeding them uh, and so on. So, it's a cheap food, it's a constant feeding rate. Now, if the sow has lost, especially if she's especially thin after weaning, give her two and a half kilos. If she's in a, already in a three condition, give her two kilos during that time. Gilts, keep them on two and, a, two, two and a half again, and so on, just so they still grow, but you don't want to feed them ad lib by a long shot, uh, and so on. And also, because it's now dry sow, it's at a lower spec, lower energy, lower protein, also cost you less, and so on. That makes sense? There's another hand, Brandy. David? Uh, so I, I see some people going to supermarket and getting all vegetables and things like that. What's your take on that? Okay, so that lettuce that you're buying or getting for free, that lettuce has got 90% water in it, firstly. So you're only getting 10% dry matter. Water is water, but dry matter isn't dry matter. The second thing, actually, I am going to handle that a bit further on. Can, can, you just, can we just park that one? It will fit in, and I'll, when I do, I'll, I'll, I'll say that I'm answering that question now. Okay, uh, next one. Oh, sorry. Now, guys, remember what we said, uh, uh, what Bob standard is? Okay, so, so, this so, is a creep. So, 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 somebody aggressively asked. Can you give the pregnant cell? When can you start giving it to lactating? Okay, um, guys, the biggest problem you have the week before farrowing and the week after farrowing. Who, who's had problems there with their sows? Stop eating. Why are they stopping eating? Because they get constipated. What does constipated mean? Blocked up, dry, and so on. Guys, when you you must teach your guys one thing. When before they start washing out, read the sign on the floor. In the farrowing unit, you want to look at the baby's poo. Which ones is watery, which ones is nice and solo, what color, color are they and so on. Because that will tell you if you've got sick babies and so on. Your baby's poo should be no 
looser than toothpaste. If it's looser than that, they are getting sick and they die from dehydration. They don't die from E. coli or salmonella, they die from dehydration. Because they're this size, they're losing more water out the back end than what's going in the front, and they die from de dehydration and so on. Um, that's more uh, Dr. Mbatsi's uh, 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 department but, but, but and so on. Is it the answer a week before she goes? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so what I'm expect? saying is, um, if you start the week before your, your, your lactation diet, it's got a bit more fiber in uh, and so on. So if you sort of, when you put her in the farrowing pen, which is usually sort of two, three, four, five days before she farrows, so she can be used to the, the farrowing pen, whether you're having a pen or a farrowing crate, or just a, a certain pen that you put her in, it's again, you moved her from where she was to a new place. It's all stressful for her. So you want her to settle in, yeah, okay, this is now my new home, and so on, a few days before farrowing. And um, when you put them in there, start giving them lactation. So it's, it's not, again, a, a change that in that time when she's you know, a shitload of things going on around her. So before then, they just don't dry so. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, I'll do a sort of a graph when up, when bad, uh, up and down uh, just now and so on. Yeah, I think the, the assumption here is that you are keeping records. If you don't know when your pig is going to give birth, then you are lost. You don't know when to start converting into lactation. So you must keep records, know when he's going to give birth, and then work backwards to say maybe a few days before she gives birth, I switch her to lactation. Otherwise, the guys, the other thing, the guys have problems with this. Um, it's, is myself pregnant. If I put a picture up and sometimes from the top or from a different angle, you can't even see. But I challenge anybody, I've got 34 years of experience, within a month of farrowing, you cannot see anything changed on her. If somebody says that's how I was pregnant uh, and uh, uh, is lying, he cannot tell you that. How do I know that my cells are pregnant? Firstly, I make them. On a certain day, I'm there, I'm writing the date down, and so on. 21 days later, I check her. No, not on heat. 42 days later, I check again. Uh, no, not on heat. Now I presume her pregnant, and so on. Guys, the best way to heat, to heat spot is when you're feeding. So they're all busy, the heads that way, the asses is this way, you can see the fannies, and so on. You see, it's been, especially gilts, man, it's a cherry like that, you can't mistake it. If, you, uh, if it looks like red and you can't see, uh, so when, they see, when you see sp uh, uh, swelling, climb in the pen and sit on her back. If she goes boom like a rocket from under you, then she's not on heat. A sow or gilt that's on heat, if you try and chase her down the passage and you touch her back then that she stands. No, oh, no, come on. <laughs> I can't touch her, but try and get her there, but if you touch her, she stands. <laughs> There's no, no science in this. You, if she stands when you climb on her back, uh, Richard posted a photo of us, him sitting on a sow and everyone said, ah, she's on heat. Our sows are just that time they come and ask for ear scratch and so on. Um, yeah, she was just being loving and so on, she wasn't on heat. But um, yeah, if you touch a sow and she stands, so that's your second check. You just look for swelling, if you, then you sit on her and she stands, then you put her to the ball. Never leave the ball with the sow. Firstly, you don't know when it's mated or whether it's mated at all. Remember guys? Absence make the heart grow fonder. What does that mean? If you haven't had it for a while, when you get together, you make sure you get some. If, if you can have it all day long, yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. Guys are good at procrastination and so on. But when, you, when they can't have it, when you put them together, yep, things happen. But then you, you're there, you see it happening, you write the date down, you know when the uh, 21, 42 day, the, 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 the expected farrowing date is. You can do your vaccinations, you can do your treatments, pre-farrowing and so on. One of my most hated questions on Facebook is, can I vaccinate or can I inject a pregnant sow? And nine out of 10 people will say, no, abortions. Oh, shit. Guys, you have to. Do your vaccinations, so I'm talking about Farishu and Littergard, which uh, Dr. Mbatsi will, will handle and so on, two weeks before farrowing and six weeks before farrowing. So six weeks before is the primary and uh, the, the, six, uh, the four weeks later, uh, two weeks before farrowing is your booster. Why are you doing it twice? Because the first one will give you a, a rise in immunity that will uh, be quite low and it will come down again. The booster will go 
much higher and it will come down much slower, it gives you a much higher level of, of immunity and so on. So that's why you're doing it twice. And you're doing it while she's pregnant. Why are you giving the farrow sure and even litter guard, which is to stop scouring in babies? You're not injecting the babies. They've got no immunity when they're born. Where do they get the immunity from? Is passively from their mother through the colostrum. So you're giving her the disease in a, in a weakened form that she builds up antibodies to give it to the babies when, when they've got no antibodies through the colostrum. So that's why you're injecting the cells to protect the babies. You're not injecting the babies with, fellow, with, with little guard. Sure, sure. Did you just say, I, I heard you say that the soul is a and wait to see it happen. So I just can't close it. No, no. no. If, you, if you put it in there, you don't know whether it's happened or at, at all or when it happened. So you don't know when she's going to farrow. You can't do your vaccinations because it, unless you just so estimate. You see it happen. Supervised. It's supervised mating. Supervised. How many times does it? Sorry, it's a silly question. Yeah, no, no. I know what you want to say. Yeah. Three times. Oh. I might. So I win on Thursday, Monday morning I made them. Tuesday, uh, Monday afternoon, AM, PM, PM that night I made them again. Tuesday morning I made them, third time. Ah. And you separate them after, after yeah. the session? Ping, back, ping, oh. back, ping, oh. back, three times. One cell. Now, guys, it's a fact that if you use more than one ball on the same cell in the, in the same heat, it will increase your litter size. Uh, I managed the big research unit at Massey University in New Zealand and um, we, it's, a, it's a small unit, it was a 66 sow unit which means it's three sows a week farrowing. We were selling pigs to research so we needed to know who their mother was, their father was, their uh, birth weight, their weaning weight, everything. Then we had record systems coming up to our ears because we sold that, res that information to the researchers to get lesson variables and so on. Anyway, we had three balls, we had a pure Duroc, a pure land race and a pure large white, uh, and so on. Now, 90% or 95% of the time, we kept with the same boar to the same cell because we, that otherwise, if you've got two boars, then it's uh, that they out and they can't use them in research. But every now and then, this boar gave a shot in the morning and this afternoon, he didn't feel like it. So you use another boar. And we often get, it's like in a litter, seven white babies and four brown babies from the Europe, obviously. And, and it does, it's a fact, it will increase your, your litter size. So um, if you're just commercial, if you've got extra bores, use a different bore the second and, or third time, depending on how many bores you've got and how many cells are due to come on heat and so on. Uh, but it does increase your, your, your litter size. But then yeah, it screws up your records and so on. Eh? But now, um, course, yeah, yeah. now, if you use different bores, um, you, we were talking about the... Uh, that screws up, your, it screws up your record keeping system. Oh. Yeah, but then I can't tell you, this is non-related, so I can't sell you a ball and guilt. But I can sell it to you as a ball if you just want a ball, but I can't sell you guilt either uh, at the same time. So yeah, that, that screws up your whole record keeping system and so on. But um, there's a few more questions. Uh, okay. uh, when did you say you vaccinate? So vaccinations uh, is, is a, a primary and a booster, six weeks before farrowing and two weeks before farrowing. Now the other thing that you need to do at two weeks before farrowing is to do uh, ivermectin. Ivermectin deworms internal parasites and external uh, mange and li lice and ticks. So that cleans it up outside and inside at the same time. Um, especially, okay, deworming. The thing is, guys, if those babies are born, firstly, they've got no immune system, okay? Now the mom infects them with worms. Now guys, yeah, not, not, well, very few farmers know how pigs react to worms. People think that they, they're growing slower from worms because the worms eat some of their food. The amount of worms, the amount that they could eat is negligible. What happens is with worm infection, and the, the pigs have an immune response to it. The same as if they were infected with a disease. And when your body, your immune system goes into war mode, Everything else stands still. Yet when America went into the First World War, they stopped making cars and they made jeeps, and they start, stopped making trucks and they made tanks. Yet every other industry came to a dead stop. Everything, all the resources went into the war effort. Same with your body. If you have an immune response, 
everything goes and fights the enemy and so on. So growth and reproduction all goes out the windows and so on. So that's one re immune response. Um, now the other thing is, so that's a big benefit. If your babies aren't challenged, they've got no immune system and they're not challenged by worms, they're not challenged by E. coli because you, you have vaccinated the cell as well and you, you, you deworm the cell. But a, a major thing that most of your deaths in the first 24 hours is overlays by the cell. Every time that sow is on her feet, she is a death threat to the babies. So if she's itching, she's got scroptic manes, those little buggers, they are arachnids, they've got eight legs, they dig a hole into the skin, they lay the eggs there and they itch like hell. So now the sow is, <laughs> she gets up and she scratches herself and so on, every time, she, so now she's up five times an hour instead of one every two hours. Every time she's on her feet, she's possibly squashing a baby and so on. So clean her off, and, and those mains can only live off the cell for three weeks. Is that right, Doc? Three weeks, yeah. Three to four weeks. So if you uh, 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 vaccinated sort of those two weeks before and so on, and you, you're putting her clean into a pen, they can't, she can't give the babies mains, she can't give them worms, and they can, man, some of these guys on Facebook, they, they, they deworm every month as a regular, <laughs> And it's not just the sows, with these, all these babies you've got to catch and squeeze and you know, they love the stress and all that shit. If you start them off clean and you put them in a pen uh, and they don't have contact to other, you keep them in that same group and so on, if they're not on soil, where are they going to get the worms from? That you, you, you might once in their six months lifetime maybe need to do a deworming again, but we don't. Uh, in, in three years I think we've done two uh, dewormings. No, we don't do that, definitely. But the, the thing is, guys, when you do it, do, when you do it, do every pig in your piggery. Otherwise, you, you do those and those aren't, and you're moving the pens, and then those get into that pen, and they pick it off the wall, and they're back into problems. So clean the piggery off by doing every pig once, and then, then you, you squeeze. It's uh, plain, plain sailing all the way through. OK. There's a hand what, 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 we'll do one more question. Yeah, for from the making, you put the salt to the to the bowl, stays on top of it for that five, seven minutes. Mm. Um, always never sure whether immediately the off is done, I should remove the bowl. I should give them some water, even the still in the morning, they will be so on top of it. Okay, it's always good to do it in the cooler times of the day, so earlier in the morning and, and later in the afternoon and so on. Uh, look, he's gonna, w the process is, they get together, there's a bit of foreplay. You have a bit of pushing around, smelling, uh, scent, the boars chomps like that and the foam comes out of his mouth. That's where the pheromones live. The pheromones is a, is a, 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 a gas form of hormones. So that stimulates the sow and himself and other boars that's <laughs> nearby and so on. Uh, but, but, so that's, that's one thing. Then he nudges her in the side. Uh, and she pisses a lot, a little bit often, and, and in that piss is her hormones, and he puts his nose in there, and oh yeah, no, she is, she smells right, and so on. There's a bit of foreplay going on, and then it's get on and, and so on. And guys, very importantly with a young boar, especially, make the first time pleasurable, that he looks forward to it. If you put him in with all the sows, he beats the shit up out of him and says, oh, no, shit, this, this stuff is not nice, so this is work, it's not pleasure anymore, and so on. So make it pleasurable that he looks forward and you've got, you know, uh, same with gilts. But don't get them bashed up by a, a boar and so on first time. Make sure they don't eat. Look, black pressure test, they're begging, they must be begging when you put them in there. And the boar is mature, not a, not a big boar. But a boar that knows his stuff, that he knows which end to jump on and how to do the job and so on. The other thing is, guys, help the boar. I would say pigs would have been extinct if it wasn't for the hand of man. Because they are terrible at finding the spot. It's over and under and left and right and everywhere but the right. Cut the ass and everywhere else except the right spot and so on. So now don't grab the thing and put it in there because as soon as you grab it, he pulls back and so on. But firstly, guys, wear a glove. Because otherwise your wife won't you let you anywhere in Europe for the next five days. The second thing is, do not wear powdered gloves. That powder is spermicidal. What, is, what does that mean? It kills the sperm. Okay, blood is also spermicidal. So if she bleeds there after the mating, um, then um, expect 
a return to service and so on. Blood is also, also kills the sperm. But, so what you're doing is you put on an unpowdered uh, glove, you put your hand upside down, now his penis is here, and what you're doing is basically he's going to go down the, the top of your palm into the right spot. So you just guide him, you're just making him a channel for the penis to go into the right spot. In the first thing, otherwise he jumps up and he scratches some sows. Boars have got bad manners and they scratch the shit out of the sows back and says, ah, I get this. this shit. And so on. So um, get, get him trained to do the job efficiently and so on. Make it pleasurable for, for, for all the parties involved, including yourself and so on. Now, while he's busy doing foreplay there and so on, you've got your mating list in front of you. you get, while he's doing foreplay, you can say, okay, 21 days ago, that sow was mated. Yeah, no, no, nothing on it. 42 days ago, that sow was mated. No, it's not, yep, tick, tick. One job done, three, three things in one job, and so on. But make it pleasurable, and, and make it observed. No, you didn't answer his question. He was saying, when you put it in with the sole and the bowl, are you sure of a one-time success rate, or is it better to keep it? You, you ne you're never sure. Okay, especially heat, uh, hot days, uh, even in New Zealand, which is shit cold, the, the, the northern part of New Zealand is under the southern part of Africa, it's closer to the South Pole, it's bloody cold, and even in there, in February, which is our hottest month, you get more returns of service and so on. And guilds, guys, if you buy a guild from somebody, and you, she doesn't get mated, don't hang on to her for a year and try and try and try. Guys, it is normal for between 10 and 30% of guilds m not to get pregnant. It is a fact of life uh, that some of them don't, and so on. Give them two chances, after that send them to the Abitur and so on. Not like Dito, a year later, <laughs> send them to Abitur, by then she's eaten up with five sows worth of food and he's got nothing from it and so on, but it is normal. But um, spot them, make sure that your guys even get, uh, guys, incentives are always good. If you give them a job, they might do it or not, uh, and so on, or as soon as you turn your back, they, they, they go to his uh, house and so on. But if you say, listen, um, every time you spot, especially your guilds, because you have sows, you wean, you know, when they come on heat, your guilds, if you spot a guilt on heat and get a mate successfully, 100 pull up. It's, it's, a, it's a bargain for you, and it's a hell of an incentive for you. <coughs> Taking those clothes out and so on. Give them incentives, guys. Maybe before Stambo comes in, um, this issue of uh, mating, we have another program, Basic Figure uh, Husbandry, where we actually show you Keep the practicals. Yeah, mating, all that. So the mating session is there, it happens. Uh, you know, you watch all everything, and then in the end, there's something that comes that shows you that it was a, a successful uh, mating session. Uh, who, 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 yeah, somebody brings out the white gel. Is it the he or the she? The she. Yeah, no, the, the, the ball. The ball, yeah. ball screws screw in, puts the stuff in there, and then it puts a plug in there. That that thick jelly, jelly and so on that comes out the back end. Uh, but yeah, uh, guys, uh, uh, let's move on, otherwise we won't finish this. But yeah, as, as we said, if you, the practical bits, we, we will do on the farm on, on a different course. Uh, it, uh, a few guys here have been there. So far, I think not one course we haven't had a sow to mate uh, and so on. But um, we've always, we've always had a sow ready. Yeah, because we yeah, we, what we do is instead of uh, weaning on a Thursday to come on eat on Monday, we wean on a Monday and she comes on eat on this Friday, Friday, Saturday for the for second mating and so on. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, Dr. Mbatsi and I have spoken many times. You saw the Bob standard. Now this is NRC, so this National Research Council, which is the authority on pig nutrition or on anything with nutrition and so on this is the this is the uh, the authority in it if you're looking at uh, protein levels for creep 23 to 25 percent where where's uh, bobs 19 percent uh wiener 19 to 20 percent two to percent they've got 18 percent so you can see the bob standards is way down there for for what it should be once well, to make it cheaper. Maybe that's what the, I mean, you know the standards are made by a committee, yeah. and there's a piggery representative there. Yeah. yeah, but you might find that at the time, there wasn't somebody who was competent yeah. enough to, 
to influence the, the proper standards. Yeah. Guys, the day I, I graduated, you got hit on the head with a square hat, and you think, yes, I've made it, I'm God, I know everything. <laughs> First day on the farm, oh shit, I know nothing. Most of the degree officers are at that stage. Yeah, they've qualified, they, they got a degree, they got a job at, at uh, math and they, at, with a uh, degree officer in, in the area. But they're scared to put their toe, toe, toe out that door because somebody, some farmers can ask them a question that they can't answer. And they're scared of being found out. So they don't leave their office for anything and so on. And um, yeah, so with the, the, getting information is difficult and getting the right information is even more difficult. I think just as a thing, the, the Bob standards um, across the, all the animal feed uh, things, some of them are way, way below what you should be doing. This not only applies to the um, pig feed, we have problems with the chicken feed, etc. So sometimes you'll probably find us not referring, like in this case, to the Bob standards because Bonnet, they use the barest of the barest minimums which are, is essentially keeping the pigs alive or keeping the chickens alive. And of course, a lot of the manufacturers, one of your most important and expensive ingredients in your pig feed is the protein. So anything that is going to put the standards for them to reduce, they're going to actually go for the lowest to make the food cheaper. But it does not translate to um, the growth rates that you need. So if, if, you, if you are going to be following the current Bob standards, then I will put my head on the block. I don't them to work on Bob's. We've been talking to them so many times that their standards are letting the industry down. They are way, way, way below par, way, way below what any piggery farmer should be using. Because it is part of this problem is that you as farmers then go and blame the feed manufacturer. One day they just simply say, put the follow a Bob's. They should be, and you as consumers should be demanding that um, they are above bobs. There's only one feed company without necessarily marketing them that has decided to change because of the science, and that is Toro Holdings. They've looked at the science, Cobas has gone to them, they've seen it for a, where they should be, and yes, you will pay more, but the result is you will get more profit. Yeah. Cheap food is not cheap if it doesn't make a big start. Yes. Thank you. you can. Okay, so, so you can see the discrepancy between what NRC says and what uh, Bob says. Okay, next one. Okay, now guys, a balanced diet. What does that mean? Now, we, we got guys who buy a go, our, our grower, the balanced, perfect man will make your pigs grow like, like a, a race, <coughs> racehorse. And then they go to, to, uh, to Bollocks and they go and buy a bulk bag full of bran and they mix half half and mm, now nah, it's cheaper. <laughs> <sighs> now it's not balanced anymore. That bran has got 11% protein, uh, the, the, the grower's got 16, so you end up with 12 and a half. <coughs> That's <coughs> under <coughs> south. <coughs> now guys, nutrients work like this. It's like an old wine, wine barrel. Your, your maximum production is your, at your first limiting nutrient. So if the, the lysine level is there and so on, now if it's here, if they're all here, they are all in the right ratio, what they should be. So it's not amounts, but it's the, the, the ratio of them is right. Okay, now if lysine is deficient, the water starts running out at that level. So now you put some lysine in and you lift it up to there. Now the water will uh, gather up to there. Now the next limiting nutrient might be energy. So now you top it up there, and, but it's still not growing full barrel and so on. Then you lay, lift your protein and now it's producing there. And then you have to, you've got your phosphate ratio right there and now you're producing at top. So if you haven't got a balanced diet, you are being stuck down the bottom here somewhere. And that's why they do not grow. Now guys, one of my other bugbears in life on Facebook and so on is fiber. Guys, why does goats and sheep and cattle have four stomachs? And you and us and chickens only have one. Why do they need three extra stomachs? Why? What does those other three stomachs do? They break down fiber. Now guys, you in your body have got enzymes to break down food, okay? And um, 
so uh, 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 the enzymes that break down the carbohydrates, you've got all the enzymes, that you've got uh, fructose, lactose, all the sugars, <coughs> starch and so on, you've got the enzymes that can break those down. But there's one, uh, 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 well, sugar, uh, 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 cellulose, anything ending with the OSE at the end is a sugar, or a chain of sugars, uh, and so on. So cellulose is a sugar. Now, if, you, if we had cellulase ending at the ASE, that's the enzyme that breaks down cellulose. No mammal has got cellulase. So how can a sheep, now most of grass is cellulose. It's a fiber. And fibers are long chains of sugars. There is a shake load of energy in fiber. But it's bound in such strong chemical bonds that you and you don't have the enzymes to break those bonds. So you can't digest it. So all that fiber does for you is keep you from being constipated. <laughs> it keeps things moving through. There's no nutrition in it for you. It just keeps things moving, which is very important. I won't tell my joke about the, the <laughs> organs and so on. I was waiting <laughs> but um, yeah, but it's pretty important for things to keep on moving through. Now the science, sorry, uh, well left out last time. After looking for the baby's poos, look at the mum's poos. What should it look like and what should it not look like? Should not look like donkey poos. You know those little round balls? Mm -hmm. That means it was dry and mm -hmm. fell out like that. It's dry and it's hard and so on. It should be like a thick porridge sort of falling in a, in a, in a bunch. It's sort of nice. It's not running but sort of a thick porridge that stands together. That's perfect. So if you see hard poos, add more bran. The best thing to, to add uh, actually and so on is um, uh, what's it called? Uh, magnesium, what's it? Covered it. Uh, no, no, um, uh, white stuff that kids, you give your kids to drink. It's oh, okay. Um, milk of magnesium. That's it. Ma Sinti. Milk of magnesium and so on. It, it, uh, it uh, absorbs more moisture and keeps her loose and so on. But uh, extra bran helps if she's still eating, but even if she's already constipated, it doesn't solve the problem. It will prevent it if, it's, if she's not quite there yet. So when you get within a week of, of, uh, of farrowing and so on, either feed her, drop her food, add more bran and so on, or feeding a lactation diet and so on. Or another way to, if she's already uh, oil, you just a cup of cooking oil, sunflower oil, any the cheapest of the oils on top of the food and that will lubricate things and start it moving a bit uh, through and so on. But it's a big, big problem is that constipation just before, just after. Because if, if, she's, if nothing is moving through here, nothing going in, no milk being produced, babies, everything suffer and, and, and big problems and so on. So limiting nutrient. Okay, uh, next one. Other <coughs> uh, way. Five more minutes. Oh, Other way. Okay, yeah, so you were just saying that why is there four extra stomachs and so on compared to a, a metagastric? I guess the next one. Okay, so guys, uh, yeah. So guys, what we're using to measure energy is uh, megajoules of energy. Now, there's different ways of measuring energy. You can uh, use TDM, you can use digestible energy, you can use net energy and so on. But um, the gross energy basically means nothing. A log of wood has got more than 19 megajoules of energy, but if you feed that to your cell, not going to do anything. So it's not digestible. Okay, so gross energy doesn't help. Now, because there are more losses to that. The losses, the first one is fecal energy, the poos. So digestibility means what you feed minus what comes out is digestible. So that stays in the body, it's not passed out of the back and so on. But that is not all the losses that you have from food. There's also urine losses. So if you take, so if you, if you started with 19 megajoules uh, and you take the, the fetal energy off, um, so you lose 7.4, the, the urinary from the urine uh, and so on also got protein and, and, and some energy left in it. It's not completely used up by the pig. So you take that off as well. Then uh, you, um, now the methane is a gas and it's very difficult to uh, measure and so on. But if you take all of those off the, the gross energy, it leaves you with, um, sorry, with uh, metabolizable energy. So if you take all those, in, those losses off, then you end it with um, metabolizable energy. And that's what we work with. 
There is a better one, which is net energy, but the thing that's not off here yet is the gas, and um, sorry, the heat loss. And heat loss is very, very variable, and it's very difficult to, to measure. So it would take, it's too expensive to, to work out, and it's too variable. It varies from day to day, day to day. So that's why we're working on metabolizable energy in measuring energy and so on. It might be a bit technical for some, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll move on. Okay, so this is what I said. So carbohydrates, with your maize, your sorghum, your barley, those kind of uh, sources and so on, consist out of sugars, starch, and fiber. <coughs> now the fibers, cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, are not digestible by us, by pigs, by chickens. It can't be digested. And so on. And okay, lignin is totally undigestible. That's like wood. Um, that's the reinforcing that keeps plants growing higher. Just like high-rise buildings, the more higher you want to go, the more reinforcing you put into the concrete. In, uh, lignin is the reinforcing to keep a, a barley plant and the seed head at the top upright so it doesn't fall over. So that's totally undigestible. These two are digestible ruminants. What breaks those chains for them? Those three chambers, that's where bacteria live. The bacteria break down the fiber for them. Then they, the bacteria, and the food that they've now broken down moves through. And so cows and sheep, um, protein is not that important. They've got a built-in protein source. Those bacteria also become the protein for the cow. So they've got a built-in protein factory in there that breaks down their food and then become the food as well. And they multiply incredibly fast so they won't run out. But pigs, we don't have that, so we've got to feed it there. The other thing, guys, is okay. Next one is that um, the thing about uh, fibrous food. So you're putting that extra bran from bollocks in there and so on, guys. It's faster just pour it in the drain at the end. It's much faster process that way, and so on, because it can't be digested. So now you've got a wiener with a stomach the size of a golf ball, and you put 20% extra bran in there, which you can't, which you can't uh, digest. So he grows that much slower. So just don't do it, please. Uh, and so on. The other thing, so apart from taking up the space, is that it moves through the pig slower. So instead of having three refills a day, it can only have two refills a day. All of that brings down the total intake, the total growth, and so on. Yet it's not rocket science. The more food you can put in it and that it can digest, the faster your growth is going to be. So you're, so you're delaying your, your piglet to grow? It's pointless, basically, what some of the guys are doing. They're buying bulk brand and they're buying concentrate. I mean, with all the license and the rest. Mm -hmm. And adding it to the brand, it's counterproductive. Yeah. They're actually not cheap. It's like uh, running a race car with, with 93 petrol instead of you know, whatever they use, <laughs> pure alcohol or whatever. Okay, so guys, the brand. What is brand? Brand is the outside covering here. And that is completely cellulose and so on. So in a maize book, uh, if you, uh, so they, they take this outside little skin off, and that's your maize bran. The inside bit, the orange bit here, is your starches, with the starch. And the, the, the germ, the little baby plant, that's where your DNA is, that's where the DNA is protein. And so on, so there's the protein uh, in here, that is the starch, that's the energy source for the little baby plant. Mom sends him away with a lunchbox, so when he lands on the ground, he's got energy to put up a leaf and start getting sunlight and get some water and so on. That's his lunchbox that he goes away with and so on. But when we want maize meal, we take that little crust off because you don't want that fiber in your thing when you're eating your white maize meal and so on. So that is your maize bran and so on. Same with, with your uh, wheat grain and so on. This uh, wheat bran is that little outside skin and it's cellulose and pigs can't digest it. So don't put it... There's already enough in the food that you can't, the, 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 the constant, uh, the, the balanced ration, there is already fiber. Because there's fiber in soya, there's fiber in everything already, and we've put in a little bit extra just to keep things flowing. If you add now more, then you just uh, put on the brakes, no, nothing happens growth wise. Okay, next one. Now, this is a, a typical plant cell and a typical animal cell. An animal cell has got a cell membrane, a thin little thing like a balloon. That's why if you push a dent there, it dip, dents and you push it out and it pushes back in. You see, when you get old to my age, it comes back a bit slower uh, and so on. But it's, it's pliable, it's, it's like a balloon with water and you can push a dent in and it pops out again. 
you try and do that with a three trunk, push a dent in there, uh, it's not going to happen. So it's much sturdier. So this is a cell membrane. The plant also have a cell membrane, but outside of that they have a cell wall, which is totally cellulose. It's a structural material. It's the concrete that holds a cell together. And that is the cellulose, the hemicellulose, the lignin, and which is totally... Now if you dehydrate that thing and you take all the water out, about 75 to 80% of that weight excess uh, without the water is cellulose. There's a bit of protein from the nucleus and there's a bit of starch and sugars in the, in the, in the uh, cytoplasma and so on. But um, 90, 70, 80 percent of it is cellulose. And that's why you don't feed extra bran. There's enough in it in a balanced diet already. Don't add anything more. Okay, the other thing is now if you go and look at the feeds out there, you won't see a lot of difference because it's the same ingredients in different ratios between the different, more soya, more protein, get more digestible for the creeps and so on, less in the dry cells. So it's same ingredients, bar one or two, but um, in different ratios. But you'll also see uh, right in the beginning, sort of in February last year, a few guys complained, uh, I don't know if you were one of them, Igor, yeah. that there were some whole pips. Now, if you've put a whole a handful of whole maize pips in, in your pig food, and you go and check their poos afterwards, you'll find all those pips in the poos. It goes right through the pig undigested. And so they put in new sieves and so on. Now you'll see it's a beautiful, even consistency and so on. Why is it important to grind your maize? And also in South Africa, they buy number three uh, maize, three, which is a much coarser ground. It's more like chickens with crushed maize. Those big bits also go right through. You need to have it small enough because the surface area where enzymes can work on it is increased when you have smaller particles. So if you take this Rubik's Cube, the, the surface area of that, say let's each block is one centimeter by one centimeter. So the whole block the has got 50 cents, 54 centimeters of surface area. But if you break that thing up into little ones, then you've got 162 square centimeters of surface area. So you see the smaller the particle is, the more the enzymes can get to it and suck out the nutrients out of it. That's why it's important, the, the consistency of the food. So Tono changed the meal, or that, that, that membrane? That yeah, 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 so the sieve. Fine enough. A fi finer sieve, yeah. So the sieve is, with the hammer mill, the hole maze is here, the thing comes around, pushes it through the holes, They've got smaller holes for it to push through. Uh, so Some of the cheaper feed I've seen, what was it, agri feed? I, I'm, I'm not sure, I forgot the manufacturer. But Just like, of course, like chicken feed. bits of corn in it. I mean, how can pigs now... What that goes right through, it's wasted. It's, yeah. you could, yeah. wasting your time. Okay, so guys, this is, the, this is how you should feed. So, you two to two and a half kilos, depending on the sow's condition, coming out of, of weaning and so on, is what you feed. So this is after you've just mated it. So for the first... 12 and a half weeks uh, and so on, or four weeks back from farrowing, all they need is two and a half kilos, two to two and a half kilos, depending on the sales condition. The last four weeks, ladies, last trimester, you know what I'm talking about, the guys won't. Uh, last, the last trimester, the last third of pregnancy, 75% of the birth weight of the piggy is put on. Guys, in the last days, they're putting on like 100 grams a day. Now you all know that you, if you add one sow farrowing, you know the little ones, they die. The bigger ones, you haven't got any problem, they go, they find the teeth, they do their job, they grow and they, they find. So your, your losses is directly related to the birth weight. And guys, the good news is you are in control of the birth weight. How do you do that? You give them more food when they need it more. So in that last third of pregnancy, you step their food up from two and a half to four, uh, three, three, three plus, three and three and a half kilos. But you, you increase their feeding level in the last four weeks and you'll have heavy, heavier babies, more of them surviving, more of them growing better. So in the last four weeks. Then, as I said, that on the day that she gives birth, she, you can't feed her seven kilos, she can't eat it, she says, well, don't want to anyway, they're tired and stressed and so on. But over the first week, you step them up slowly. Guys, if you don't have a, a scale or you don't have a cell feeder and so on, if you put food in the morning, uh, sows, because you're feeding seven kilos, if you feed them once, they're going to spill half of it and so on. So give them two or three feeds a day. 
at least two. Feed them in the morning, by, uh, by three, four o'clock, just before knockoff, they feed them again. If it's cleaned up, st step it up. Then tomorrow morning, there should be a little bit of food left. If they polish the trough, what does that mean? They ran out somewhere during the night. So there should always, the next morning, be a little bit of, then you know you're feeding ad lib, and so on. And then you're getting maximum milk production, maximum baby growth, money, 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 going into your pocket, and so on. So step them up, and I said that level is two kilos for the sow, plus a half a kilo per piglet that she suckles. So even if she's got three piglets, that's one and a half plus two, so you're feeding her three and a half kilos, um, and so on. So, and, and then again, it's easier to, to say to you guys, uh, that if this takes two kilos, uh, one scoop for every four babies. If you say to them, give them a half kilo per thing there. But if you say you get four, four piglets, one <coughs> scoop of three, uh, oh, sorry, that, uh, uh, I mean, you're feeding this to the sow, uh, but if she's got four babies, one, uh, you've got eight babies, two of those, and, and so on, then they're getting much, close, much closer to the level and so on. Then you're feeding at that top level at seven kilos if it's, if it's ten babies there. Now, guys, weaning. People starve them before to dry them off and so on. Guys, piglets drink every two hours. You go and stand there and time them and so on. Every two hours she calls and they all run drinking. Why do they drink little bits often rather than a calf that drinks twice a day and so on? Is that a cow has got a, a big hollow a cistern inside where they can build up milk. And they've got a teat system as well which adds a little bit of volume. But they can store up so much and drink it in, in one big go. Pigs other do not have that. They produce and it's got to be drunk before they can produce again. So every two hours they drink. Now it's, it's, it's a pain in the ass when you've got a sow that dies or if you haven't got milk and you've got to bottle feed the, the babies. Every two hours through the night it's like raising children and so on. But um, uh, so when you wean her that day, if you fed her seven kilos that morning, she's producing seven kilos worth of milk and so on, you've taken the babies away and she blows up like a balloon and you've got big trouble. Mastitis and other problems and so on. She Guys, my, my, my son was thin and skinny but t t tall like that when he was born. My wife was a dairy cow like you can't believe. <laughs> the, 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 the health nurse said he was going like that and he was going like that. She was a dairy cow galore. But then he got sick and he wouldn't drink and she said, it was excruciating pain not being drunk out and so on. And the thing is, milking, uh, getting the milk out of a sow's teeth, you're getting the 20 moles from each teeth, so it's a hell of a time consuming extracting milk from a sow and so on. I've got a formula and so on for, for that. But anyway, so what I'm saying is, she's used to being drunk out two hours. So in a 24 hour period, she's milked, she's missed 12 milkings. That's, she's dried off after 24 hours. It doesn't take three, four days like in a dairy cow and so on. It's because you know, the dairy cow drinks twice a day, these guys drink 12 times a day, so they dry off a lot quicker. <coughs> so the day that you wean her, just give her one and a half or two kilos or one and a half plus a scoop of bran or something and so on to help her dry off. So now that she's produced less because you fed her less that day, that just for that day and so on, she's dried off. And then you step her up to four kilos. Why do you step her up now? In those four days when she's in between being weaned and farrow again, why do you step her up again then? So we weaned and mated. Yeah, between weaning and, and remating. Flushing. But we all know cows, sheep and so on, you know how to flush them. And, and basically flushing works like that. You give them a higher, uh, a rising plane of nutrition. And it works a bit like this. Even with sheep and so on, you can have a thinner sheep and you give her a rising plane of nutrition and she thinks that's getting better and better. By the time the baby gets here, there's going to be lots of food, so she does get pregnant. Or if you, feed, if you feed her less and so on, you think, oh, things are getting worse and worse. <laughs> Why get pregnant? There's, there's going to be no food by the time the baby comes and then the, even if she's in better body condition, if she drops in, in nutrition, she doesn't get pregnant. So flushing her means she produces more eggs, which means you can have more babies and so on. So during that, so drop her there, dry her off, step her up to four kilos so she produces more eggs, 
mater, and of course, after mating, drop her back to a level that she will stay on the rest of the. So that's basically sow feeding. You have the same growth for the, for the little ones coming up. Uh, you know, so the, the, the goal for the, for the babies is that, that red one with the growth rates, weekly basis, and so on. The, the, ones with the, the one with the, the, the red boxes, isn't there the numbers like this? You say so many kilograms? Yeah, no, so that's uh, for, 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 week, uh, for that week, and so on, they're eating 1.18 kilograms, uh, 1.18, and so on, but it's per day. So you multiply that by seven, and then for the second one, they get to 1.3 kilos times seven. You add those all up. Well, the numbers there. I don't think it's right. Were they, were they there? Yeah, yeah, in that first, uh, that, r right. that red one. Guys, cell feeder, one slab of, uh, of, of uh, chatter fly, 18 mil. You cut it, okay, it's 1.2 wide by 2.4. You cut it 80, 80, 80, okay? This one is the back. This one is the diagonal. That is the two sides. And what's rest, okay, you've got to join them and so on, but that forms the, the bottom. This here is a, a rafter, so 114 by 38 in there. The important bit at the bottom here, five centimeters from the back and five centimeters from the floor, you've got a gap. So the four, four feet fall through there, it comes out here. And the only thing I haven't got in here, I used to put in four um, threaded rods to make four, comp uh, sorry, three threaded, uh, threaded rods, which makes four compartments, feeding compartments. Um, I'm now putting in five, well, f five feeding compartments, four things. So it's a, a little bit uh, smaller like that. If you don't put those in, they, they, they don't spill it out here, they push it to the side and then it overflows from the corners. But if you've got those in, no spillage. You can put 150 kilos of there and that's food. So it's 24. 4 7, there's food in front of them whenever they feel like it. They never fight, they're never hungry, uh, and so on. And with, you can basically fill it up Friday afternoon and fill it up again on Monday, and so on. One sheet of shatter ply, I use um, aluminium 4x4 uh, angle iron, just bolted together like that. Um, a piece of uh, uh, brand, uh, rafter there, and a 38x38 38 38 there, knocked together in an hour. And so on. Uh, uh, Dieter up in Kahansi actually makes them for sale, but um, yeah, very easy to make yourself and, and so on. Uh, we've been using ours, when I suggested the first people said that's going to fall apart, the pigs are going to eat it up, we've been using ours for three years, they're as good as the day I started. Um, how much have I got left? Do, uh, do you need to uh, hold the one to the wall? It's a, well, you can actually make a double sided one. So you've got two there with feeding on both sides, and you can actually put it between two pens. And with these guys eat here, and these guys eat here, so that's also possible. But yeah, it's better against the wall, uh, and so on. And it also takes, also takes a, a small space out of your pen surface area, and so on. Okay. And the advantage is that um, the guy just empties one or two bags into it. He doesn't have to come again to, you know, that day. And he also doesn't have to measure off and all those kind yeah, of things. Yeah, there's no measuring off. Yeah. All you've got to see is that there's food in there all, all the time. Um, okay, that, that I can leave, otherwise we don't. So, you, so here's our, those numbering system again. Remember, ones and tens on this side. So one is one little notch at the top, two is two notches, three is at the tip, four is a three and a one, five is just under the tip, Six is a, a five and a one, and so on. And on the, on the ten side, the same on this side, just with a zero on it, and so on. Um, yeah, so if you're not 100% sure about that, I'll give you the, 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 the handouts to do those. Yeah, but you also, this you do as 